Good morning, everybody. Welcome, and we appreciate you joining us by Facebook as uh, we are today gathering to worship the Lord. We know this is very unusual, strange times. Uh, things have definitely not been the same in the last number of weeks. We appreciate everyone's patience with the one call now that we have to make. Uh, continue to be patient with us as we're having to continually adjust and make changes. Um, we may even call tomorrow, make some changes for the upcoming things as we're looking over all of the state of North Carolina governor's uh, regulations from yesterday's announcement that takes effect at 5 p.m. on Monday. But um, we do want to welcome you in the name of Jesus. We'd like to uh, go ahead and cite our verse of the week for the week, and it's 1 John 4, 4. And this is in the New Living Translation, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. We as believers need to know that we have victory. We, victory. we are not defeated. We are walking in victory, and we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting with victory. Also want to take just a moment and recognize any birthdays and anniversaries. Normally we don't do this, but since uh, everybody's not normally able to come now in the, in the situation, I want to recognize that this coming week we have a happy birthday to Billy Ray Jones uh, on the 29th, which is, of course, today. And J.J. Martin, the 31st, and Carlene Norkett, the 3rd of April. And then happy anniversary to Robbie and Annie Bogan on April the 2nd, and also April the 2nd for Junior and Teresa Boyles. So uh, happy uh, birthday and anniversary. do want to mention before I get any further that I do want to remind everybody to pray for Daniel Fabricatori. He is actually leaving on Monday, that is, uh, which will be tomorrow uh, as you're watching this, uh, on March the 30th. And he will be headed to New York to help serve at the Javits Center there in his service to our nation and helping that situation. Let's pray for his protection, for the blood of Christ to cover him, and that he'll come back safe, sound, and whole, and that he'll be able to accomplish his purpose there and serve the people of our good country. All right, let's take a moment and let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this moment. We do ask, Lord, that you would help us to hear your voice, that we would concentrate together as the body of Christ concerning our discipline together of coming together, even if it is by means of technology over a, a, a phone or a computer screen. Lord, we thank you for this technology. We thank you for us being able to harness that and use it for your glory. And we pray that you will get glory from it. We thank you for all the churches that are utilizing this technology to proclaim the gospel. And we pray that as we utilize this technology that others will hear that perhaps would never dawn the doors of a church, but they would hear the gospel and be saved. Lord, I'm reminded of a neighbor that just yesterday we ran into on our way back from picking up breakfast at Hardy's, and we saw him as he was on the side of the road. We stopped to speak with him, and Lord, he was unloading his heart of how this has really grasped him and got a hold of him in a most spiritual way, and he began to ask questions about the end of time and about what's going on, and he felt so it, uh, fearful for a while, but how he has now come to terms, and he settled, Lord, to just trust in you, and we thank you for that. We pray for those who are continued uh, to be troubled by, about this, that they will have peace and not live in fear. We pray that you'll continue to shroud your people with your protection, your provision. Help them, God, to know that you're the one that holds them in your hand, and you're the sovereign Lord. You're Jehovah Jireh. You have provided for us always, and you will never fail us. Help us to trust that, Lord. We ask your blessing upon this service, and we pray that we will hear your, your word and that your voice would speak to us and that we would respond during this time in a way that you would have us to respond. And may your, your will be done in our lives. May your spirit continue to purge us, prepare us for what yet is to come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm going to ask uh, at this time, uh, we're not, of course, not taking up an offering in the service. If you're here, uh, of course, we just ask that you too uh, give your offerings either by dropping them by the office to Brother Willie Jones Monday through Thursday from 8 to 12. He'll be continuing to do his work there. And uh, also do want to remind you of the P.O. Box 528, Olivia, North Carolina, 28368, if you want to send in your offerings by mail. Also, the give link on cmmchurch.com with the green box, just tap on that. Follow the prompts there, and you'll be able to give online as well as we've already had some do that. I do want to mention to you that we do have a copy of the state of North Carolina, uh, Governor Roy Cooper's uh, proclamation from yesterday, which takes effect on 
the 30th at 5 p.m. We have it in our hands, just so you'll know. And we are reading through that uh, as thoroughly as we can to make sure we understand all of its particulars and regulations. One thing we will say, it is okay if you travel to uh, a place of worship and back if you want to drop off offerings or if you need something. And, th and also for us, it's one of the essentials. Uh, if there are funerals, they are allowing up to 50 people to attend funerals. Uh, but right now, the regulation stands at 10 as mass, ga mass gathering. So there will be some adjustments being made as you'll get a one call now about that in the coming time, okay? All righty. Well, at this time, we're going to get into the Word of God. I want to talk about the subject title of repentance and restoration. One word that seems to be absent, even as I was looking this morning on the app of my, my Bible app that I use about every day of my life, it has now a daily prayer, and it's the Version Bible app. One thing that I've noticed in many of the prayers is the lacking of repentance. The word repentance seems to be absent. And uh, I read something that someone sent to me as a church member the other day, and I do believe this is true. The one thing that we need to realize in all of this is our need for repentance. You know, if this doesn't drive us to repentance, then it's evident that we're stubborn and rebellious and that we think that we're self-sufficient, and we think that as a nation we're okay and that we're by our own strength and merit going to be able to overcome this. Don't be fooled in that deception because worse things can come and will come if we don't repent. And I'm just saying that from a biblical standpoint and a spiritual standpoint of things. So let's look at the Scripture, and it's in Lamentations chapter number 3, verses 20 to 42. I will never forget this awful time. Now let me give a little bit of background here. Jeremiah the prophet is lamenting over the destruction of the beloved city called Jerusalem. The people of Israel love Jerusalem like Americans, true Americans, love America. Probably even in a deeper sense of the word. The beloved city of Jerusalem of Israel had been invaded by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Lamentations is written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. He's a compassionate prophet. And as he looks at the condition of the city that he loves, the people that he loves, the land that he loves, it is now in enemy control. It's been invaded and the city has been destroyed. Now, we haven't seen that extent of destruction. But I must say that if you're truly a child of God, this bothers you what's going on. It troubles you. And when I say bothers you, it troubles you in spirit about what's going on because you're see, seeing this not just from the natural or from the political or even the economical. You are seeing this for what it is, the biblical spiritual thing that it should. That should be the overriding and premier issue in our minds. So Jeremiah the prophet is lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem. His heart sinks in sorrow as he looks around at the condition of his beloved homeland. And I must ask you a question. Is it doing the same to our hearts? He says, I will never forget this awful time. As I grieve over my loss, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. Now, I love this. I still dare to hope when I remember this. What's the hope? It is God. He says, the faithful love of the Lord. That word Lord is capitalized in all fours, again, meaning the one true God, Yahweh. When I remember the faithfulness of God, the faithful love of the Lord. Now, I can say, in the midst of all this, God's love has never changed. His love was the same before. His love is the same during. His love will be the same after. We've already went over that in Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So Jeremiah says, the one thing I can hope in is the love of God. And let me just say, that's exactly what we need to be clinging to. And he goes on to say, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad his mercies are always extended? And he says, great is his faithfulness. The King James says, great is thy faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. They're made new every morning. The old hymn, great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. I just want to say to you, it is the faithfulness of God, the mercies of God that are made new every day. And every day we get up, we ought to say, this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We have eyes to see. We have ears to hear. We have a mouth to talk with, teeth to eat with, feet to walk with, hands to work with. We've got houses we sleep in. We've got food on our table. We've got shoes on our feet. We have life. We've got eternal life. We have reason to rejoice, children of God. So look up. Okay, look up. Things are good. His mercies begin afresh every morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. 
My inheritance is not in this world. May I remind you in the Old Testament, the Levitical tribe had no inheritance in the things of the world around them. Their inheritance was in God. I just want to say to you, our inheritance as children of God is in the Lord. It is not in the things that this earth can provide. The stuff here is just temporary. It's perishing. It's not going to last. But the truth of God lives forever, lasts forever, and we can trust in the Lord our God. He said, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in Him. What are you hoping in? Are you hoping in the president? Are you hoping in America? If you are, you're hoping in the wrong person. You must hope in the Lord. It is God that we all must hope in. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him. Are we depending on God in all of this? Or are we depending on our own selves? To those who search for Him. Now that's the question. Are we searching for God? God's not been lost. It's not like we have to say, God, where are you? I'm just saying, are we seeking so that we can, we can make sure that our hearts are in alignment with His? Are we searching for His way, His will, His work, His word to be premier and preeminent in our lives? So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. Right now as we wait in our homes, and that is people sitting at home and those not getting out as much as they used to, even if we're getting out some, not as much as we normally do, we don't get to go to the restaurants. It's time to pull up to God's table. It's time to sit before him at the supper table of God, the Lamb of God, and say, Lord, what do you want to feed me? And we need to pull up and Revelation 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. Are you inviting Jesus to spend time? Don't mesmerize and desensitize your mind with the television for hours on end during the day. Don't sit and watch about the coronavirus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are doing nothing but fear-mongering when you do that. Put your mind on the Lord, as Philippians 4.8 8 says, whatever things are true, honest, lovely, of good report, think on these things. Isaiah 26.3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We've got to trust in God here. God has been faithful in the past. He's faithful in the present. He'll be faithful in the future. He does not change. Therefore, we can trust and hope in Him. So it is good to wait quietly for the salvation from the Lord. It is good for people to submit to an early age, at an early age to the yoke of His discipline. Hebrews 12 says that whom God loves, He rebukes and He chastens. Right now, God may be spanking us. Right now, God may be getting our attention and saying, Hey, you're going to listen to me now. I hope you are. And I hope it's not temporary just like it was on 9-11. For a little while the churches were filled. I hope that when the doors open back up so we can begin to congregate again that the place is going to be packed out. But I hope it's not just momentary. I hope it's going to continue. I hope our nation is going to get the point and understand if we're going to have a future, we've got to look to the one who's the creator. And that's Jesus Christ. It's good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Don't give God your leftovers. Don't spend the flower of your life in selfish pursuit and then hand the stem of your life to God and say, here it is. Don't just accept Christ as a get-out-of-hell-free card, but give him your life. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Have you asked yourself, what is God saying to me? What is God saying to our family? What is God saying to our nation? Let them lie face down in the dust. What is it going to take for us to lie down face, uh, face forward in the dust? Prostrate before God. What is it going to take for us to fast? Earlier in the year, many churches do a Daniel fast in, in, in January, and people just move on throughout the year. And I appreciate those who fast, but God's been dealing with me to do fasting throughout the entire year. And it started at the end, the last day of, of 2019. God began to deal with even but actually back in December and parts of the end of November about fasting. We were teaching on it here at the church. But God wanted us to move into 2020 for fasting. And now I see why. God wants to get our attention to cleanse us, to purify, to prepare, and promote His gospel. And He wants His people to be ready to hear His voice. Are we so hearing all the voices around us that we're not even hearing God in all of this? Do we not believe He's sovereign? Do we not believe that He's in control? People talk about whether it be George Soros or other people's names that are brought up as potential people that have promoted and caused this kind of thing, that maybe it was politically motivated and how it was all uh, on set as a political maneuver. I just want to say to you, I don't know the truth of all of that, but I will say this. No matter what men may do, God is still sovereign. And he will use men to accomplish his will and plan just like he did Pharaoh. Let us not think for a moment that God has been caught by surprise in any of this. 
Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Yes, let us get before God and let's seek for hope. Our hope is in Him. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. No matter what the world is saying, as Jesus taught us in the New Testament, remember what He said? If a man smites you on the cheek, turn to him the other. Could it be that He was referring here to this same passage? For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. Aren't you glad that it may seem like God may be hiding, but He's not? As a matter of fact, Zephaniah means the Lord hides. Yahweh hides. But I'm glad God will manifest Himself in His Shekinah glory. He'll manifest Himself. And the Bible said if two or three are gathered together in His name, He will be in the midst of them. So let's get two or three together, even if we can't meet with ten. If we can get two or three together, and we can meet in the presence of God like we have here today, God will meet right here with us. And God can even harness even the digital technology and make it come across the Internet and f- as fresh and new and real. Aren't you glad? Because it is. Though he brings grief, he, will, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. God, it's just like a parent. God wants to spank his children. He wants to get their attention. But why is, what's the reason behind the discipline? It's to teach them because he loves them. And we love our children. And we want what's best of them to prepare them as they grow up and mature to be people of character. That's what God wants to do in this situation. Are we going to allow God to harness that and teach us to be better churches, better Christians, better servants in the middle of all this? I pray He is. Uh, he does that. We're better preachers, better churches, better children of God than we ever have been in this nation. For He does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. Do we think God gets some type of cosmic kick out of all of this? No. The Bible said it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, around verse 9. If people crush underneath, excuse me, if people crush underfoot all the prisoners of the land, if they deprive others of their rights in defiance of the Most High, El Elyon, that is, God Most High, if they twist justice in the courts, which we do here, doesn't the Lord see all these things? Let me ask you a question. What about all these abortions that we've had since 19... Uh, 73. What about kicking God out of the classroom in 1962? What about the ordination of homosexual marriage in 2015? All three of those done by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. I just want to say to the Supreme Court, there is a judge that's higher than you, and he is the supreme one who exceeds, succeeds, and, and, and precedes every person. God Almighty, Jesus Christ is his name. He's the Lord Most High, and He's watching what you say. And I don't care what the Democrats have to say about abortion. It's murder. And when God sees murder in the land, He's going to deal with it. I want to call on Governor Cooper. Shut down the abortion clinics. You're shutting down the churches. Why don't you shut down the abortion clinics? Shame on you if you don't shut them down, and yet you shut down the barber shops. Somebody ought to say amen on that one. I love you as a human being, but I just want to say to you, my job is to tell the truth. I respect your position. I I respect the office you hold, but the truth is the truth. We've got it backwards, haven't we? He says, doesn't the Lord see all these things? And I'm going to ask you, does God not see all the mess and the muck that we're in in our nation? Does he not see what's going on even in our churches? Wearing masks? Are we happy plastic people under shiny plastic steeples with walls around our weakness, with smiles that hide our pain? As the song by Casting Crown says, well, the invitation's open for every heart that has been broken. Maybe then we'll close the curtain on this stained glass masquerade. Who can command things to happen without the Lord's permission? Can any of us manufacture the air we're breathing? Can any of us manufacture the blood that we have in our bodies? Can any of us manufacture the spirit who lives inside of us as believers? Can any of us manufacture life itself? I say to you, no, only God can. So how in the world can we think we've got all the answers? We don't, only God does. Does not the Most High, El Elyon, send both calamity and good? Yes, I believe in the goodness of God, but I believe in the discipline of God. I believe in the punishment of God, and the, I believe in the judgment of God. Then why should we mere humans complain when we are punished for our sins? 
We think it's our right to just get out here and drink and party and go and do whatever we want, cuss and, and, and play our music loud and, and shake our cars almost into, into absolute bolts and nuts at our traffic lights and think it's okay to drive around and do whatever we want and walk around with our pants halfway down our, our backside and act like it's okay and right and not even dress appropriately, act correctly, have morals or, or, or principles in our life. We think it's okay and God's supposed to accept all this. I say, do you know? Where are all the preachers of righteousness? Where are the churches calling for repentance right now? Where is the word repentance? Then why should we mere humans complain when we're punished for our sins? Instead, let us test and examine our ways. What we need to do right now is we need to come in repentance before God and say, God, what are you saying to us? Let us turn back to the Lord. Some of you have an association, but the question is, do you have salvation? Many of you go to church, but is the church going through you? Let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled. Let me say that again. Let this be the theme of what we're talking about. Let us lift our hearts and hands. Maybe if you're here, even you'll do that in the sanctuary. Let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, we have sinned and rebelled. Can we say, we have sinned and rebelled? Would you say that with me? We have sinned and rebelled. Wouldn't it be great if President Trump would come out at the next press conference and say to all the press, say to the nation, we have sinned and we have rebelled, and if we want healing, we must turn to God. We can't turn to Congress. Look what some of them are trying to do, trying to piggyback the, the situation and, and not let the situation go to waste so they can accomplish a political agenda. They ought to be removed from office. Go out and vote every one of them out that don't need to be put back in there and put righteous people back in so they'll do what's right before God. It's a shameful, shameful time when anybody tries to piggyback to accomplish a political agenda in times like this. Jeremiah the prophet is weeping. The question I must ask you, are you even weeping? Or are you sitting back popping your chewing gum just saying, oh, well, we'll get through this. We got through everything else. Now, I'm not saying worry. I'm not saying sit around and bite your fingernails. I'm not saying that you ought to talk like you're defeated. You, you're, you ought not to be pessimistic. You ought to be optimistic. But I am saying to you, you ought to be weeping over the condition of our nation right now. You ought to be weeping over the condition of most churches today. Because we fancy ourselves righteous, we put on our facades, we go through the motions, we wear our certain clothes, but we don't have a heart after God. We're into entertainment, not intercession. We're into supper rooms, not upper rooms. We're into playing instead of praying. What about us? What's happening among us? God has allowed the nation we love so much to be inflicted with this awful plague, and we watch as the new casts continually feed us with negativity and fear. Let me just say, stop watching it on and on and on and on and on. It's okay to get some briefings. It's okay to get what is up-to-date information, but don't sit there and be mesmerized and desensitized by the media. Our land has been assaulted, and we are reeling as we stagger in response to this blow. Let me just say the proverb says, a good man falls down seven times but gets up eight. You may be staggered right now, but don't you just know God's got you. We too, like Jeremiah, should be broken in our hearts as we see what's happening. We must repent of our sins, turn to God, and let me just say, how dare I say this, in fasting and prayer. Instead of using this time to just try to line up at the drive through we got 20 people trying to get food, all because we're trying to fill our appetites. Why don't we just say, hey, we, we've got more food than we need in this nation in most cases. Now, I understand there are certain parts that people may impoverish People, uh, children particularly, do them without food, and I'm not saying we shouldn't look after them, but what I am saying, most of us eat way too much anyway, and our appetites have become our gods, and you can tell that right now because we're upset because we can't go to our favorite restaurants. We ought to realize, let me just say, let's try something different. Go to the kitchen. <laughs> let's try something different. Let's go to our knees. And let's fast and pray. I'm calling on the church. I'm calling on the churches around the country. Let's go to God in fasting and prayer. And let's ask God to break the strongholds, to overcome all these so-called mighty people and know that God is greater than the giant we face. Let's cry out for His mercy. 
His mercy alone can redeem us from destruction. In Matthew 17, 21, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, you can't do these things unless it's by prayer and fasting. Listen, prayer and fasting is what we need right now is the dynamic duo to knock this thing out. Can I get a hearty amen from the congregation that's listening and to the church people around the world that love Jesus? Only God can resuscitate us and only God can stabilize our condition. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10, look at the scriptures on this one. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin. God's sorrow that he's trying to bring to us is not because he's trying to hurt us, he's trying to help us. It's like when you spank a child, you're not trying to hurt the child. Although there is a momentary hurt, a momentary sting, what the longevity accomplishment, accomplished purpose is, is that they will learn from it and that they'll benefit from it and become a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block and that that sorrow will lead to gladness later kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. The sorrow of this world, people are walking around with downcast chins and, and mouths and they're worried and they're troubled. The child of God can walk through any situation. Just like Habakkuk said, though the olive tree shall not blossom and though the uh, field uh, shall fill, yield no grain to grind, though the flock shall all be scattered and there be no cattle in the stall. In Habakkuk chapter 3, the last few verses, he said, yet will I rejoice in God my salvation. Worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, Results in spiritual death. No matter how sad people are out there, no matter what the government does to try to fix things, if you don't know Christ, there's no repentance. You have the worst kind of sorrow coming. But when he sees repentance from the children of God, he will bring recovery. Repentance and restoration, that's the theme. Repentance leads to restoration. We must pray for our president, Donald Trump. We must pray for Vice President Mike Pence. We must pray for this task force. We must pray for our Congress, the House and the Senate. We must pray for the Supreme Court. We must pray for our designated leaders of various departments, the FDA and FEMA and all the other places that are trying to work in sync, our businesses that are trying to help. We need to pray for them. Yes. We need to pray for Governor Roy Cooper and the governors around our nation. We need to pray for our state and local authorities, our police officers, our fire people, all of those safety personnel, our health care professionals that are out there working right now, our pastors and our church people, each other. We are to pray for each other, love our neighbor as ourself. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible tells us we are to do this. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. God wants us to pray for people. Intercede on their behalf. Intercede means pray for those that don't even know how to pray for themselves. And give thanks for them. We should thank God for our president. We should thank God for our vice president. We should thank God for our governor. We should thank God. I'm not saying you have to agree with every policy and procedure, but you need to thank God we live in a country where we get the opportunity to enjoy what we enjoy, the benefits we have, the amenities that we have, and yet, yet the opportunities we have as well. And we ought to pray about all of this rather than sitting back and being armchair, armchair complainers. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your churches. Pray for one another so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Let's not buy into the world's complaining and fussing and cussing and all that they're doing about all this. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. The hope we have is Jesus Christ. His mercy can save us. What we must do is turn from our stubborn, sinful ways. Now let me give you a couple of scriptures about this. God, many times in the scriptures, cited how stubborn people have been. And I just want to say to you, this is not new to our generation. Humanity in general, since the fall to sin, have been stubborn, rebellious creatures. Exodus 32 says it this way. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now, you can understand God's talking to the people of Israel. He's talking to Moses, and he's talking to them about how stubborn these people are. How stubborn these people he just brought out of Egypt brought them into a place of provision miraculously in the wilderness, and look how stubborn these people are. Just because you sit on a church pew, just because you hold an office, doesn't mean you're a good godly person. You're probably stubborn and rebellious. Let's be honest. In Deuteronomy 9.13, the same thing is reiterated. 
The Lord also said to me, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Deuteronomy, again, a book of Moses. Now go all the way to Nehemiah for a moment. Nehemiah went back and rebuilt the wall in 52 days that they said couldn't be done under Xerxes that allowed him, and sympathetic he was to Nehemiah. He says, but our ancestors were proud and stubborn, and they paid no attention to your commands. People hear the word, but it goes in one ear and it goes out the other. It's like the preacher that shot the deer. The reason they knew he did, even though there were three shots fired, is because the bullet went in one ear and out the other ear. That's how they knew he shot it. Never mind. Some of you got that. They paid no attention to his commands. Are you paying attention to his commands, or are you just trying to put it on your wall because it looks to be a spiritual a decoration, or because you got one laying on your coffee table because it makes your house seem to be more sacred because you've got a Bible laying on it? Or are you looking at the command saying, God, I want to meditate on them. I want to mutter them in my lips. God, I want to cause those words to be etched in my heart. And I want to obey your principles, your precepts, your commands. How about Psalm 81, verse number 12? So I let them follow their own stubborn desires. Could it be that God is letting us have our way? Just like the Bible said in the book of Acts, God in times past let nations go their own way. It's a form of God's abandonment, letting them have their own way. Let me just tell you something. This is very blunt, but it's true. Getting your way leads to hell. Getting God's way leads to heaven. Let me say it again. Getting your way leads to hell, but getting God's way leads to heaven. In Isaiah 57, verse 17. The Bible says, I was angry, so I punished these greedy people. Now, wait a minute. Ho, 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 ho. That ought, to, that, ought to make it, that ought to jump off the page to America. I don't know of any nation on earth that's been as blessed as America back in the 90s in a book called The Coming Revival by, by the now deceased Dr. Bill Bright. He talked about how at that time America owned and possessed over 50% of the world's wealth and only one nation out of hundreds. Greedy people we are. And even the president was talking about perhaps some of these companies he'd been asking to do some things, how they were more concerned about making dollars than they were about trying to help save the country. Greedy. Maybe you've been in that. You're a contractor and you make more money on one job and some people make all week long and it took you one day and it takes them seven days to make their paycheck. Now, I'm not saying nothing, anything wrong with making a dollar, but when you make a killing, greed. I withdrew from them, but they kept going their own stubborn way. Jeremiah 5, verse 23, But my people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. Wow. You don't see too many preachers get up and read these for verses of the week in church. You don't see them preaching on subject like this because they're not inspiring. They're not motivational. But I will say they are transformational. My people are, have stubborn and rebellious hearts. Let me say that again. My people, that's God saying to his people, not the world. The church, stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned away and abandoned me. We have our own way instead of letting him have his way in the church. In many board meetings, they'd rather have their way, and it'd be easier to change the Bible than it would to change their own traditions. What a shame. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 65. Give them hard and stubborn hearts and then let your curse fall on them. Whew. Wow. Let me just say to you, I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be me. I don't know about you. I hope you don't want that to be you. Do you want God's curse to fall on you because you're stubborn, you're rebellious, you refuse to submit to God's word because you don't like this certain part of Scripture, you don't agree with that certain part of Scripture, or you just don't particularly understand that part of Scripture, so you just sort of push it to the margins? Let me just say to you, all of Scripture is the word of God. And every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that trust in Him. I don't want a curse to fall on me and my children. That's why I choose repentance and I beg for restoration. In 2 Chronicles 7, we often quote this passage. But this is what we must do to have restoration. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, Now Solomon is the king. This is David's son. God's let him build the temple. David couldn't. He had blood on his hands. He's a man of war. 
He committed adultery, but Solomon got to build the temple. David helped fund it. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as my place for making sacrifices. Notice he didn't say, as where I can come and stay, because the only temple God could live in was Adam's body, and the temple he now lives in is our bodies by the Holy Spirit. But he said, I've chosen this as a sanctuary, a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. I think that's applicable for the hour. Then if my people, not the world, but my people, the church, will humble themselves, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now let's just turn from their wicked ways. The word repent by definition means two different things. Hebrew means to turn from and in the New Testament have a change of mind. As we change our mind about our situation condition, we turn from our wicked ways and we find the truth in God's word and we decide and determine to follow it in dedication to God. We need repentance. The church needs to beseech the throne of grace through fasting and prayer to ask God for mercy to overcome all this. $2.2 trillion, $2 trillion going to just people's payouts. Up to $4 more trillion to go to businesses. Largest, single largest bill ever in the history of the United States. $6 trillion. You realize that's one-fourth of the national debt, a little more than one-fourth of the national debt? I just want to say to you, brothers and sisters, what about your children and your grandchildren who have to pay for that? And I'm, and I'm thankful that our government's trying to do something. But are we going to take that and go buy big screen TVs when we get the money? Are we going to take that money or, and, 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 and just waste it? Hard-earned tax dollars? Or are we going to take it and set it aside and say, God, what do you want me to do with this? We're going to put God first and give him what belongs off the top? Anybody out there hearing what I'm saying to you? Or are we going to do what we've always done, be stubborn and rebellious people? I'm thankful that we have the ability to do that. And I'm thankful for anything that we may receive or you may receive. But I'm going to tell you, may God give us wisdom on how we handle our finances. Hebrews 4 tells us, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, verse number 16. Then we will receive mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. I just want to ask you, do we need mercy right now? Do we need grace right now? Yes and yes. This should not be done for selfish reasons. Oh, God, get us out of this. How many of you ever been in a situation, God, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you forever, and then you don't. How many people are praying those desperation prayers? Why weren't we praying before the desperation came? Why weren't we fasting before the coronavirus came? Why weren't we seeking God in repentance before all this came? Perhaps it would have kept it from coming and it would have preempted it. Can I hear an amen or a witness from anybody out there about that? There are other things coming down the pipe, and I just want to say to you, I want God to put a stop to it for those who call out to him in repentance and restoration. Once again, I want to remind us, we have slaughtered 60 million-plus babies in America, and yes, it's slaughter. We're no better than Hitler. We, think, we, we want to talk about how bad he was in killing the Jewish people. Look how many babies we've killed. We've kicked God out of the school system and wonder what's going on, why we are where we are. We can't even mention Jesus, and even when the president mentions about trying to restart things around Resurrection Sunday, everybody wants to, uh -huh. and, and listen, I just wish you'd come out and say, because what better Sunday than the resurrection of Jesus Christ to have the church back going again? If he can raise us from, raise from the dead, he can raise us from this situation. We have homosexual marriage that's been endorsed in our country since by the Supreme Court since 2015, completely obliterating all of the other state amendments that had been passed and completely circumventing the will of the people. We are assaulted by ungodly and unbiblical ideology even in the pulpit when a lot of our pastors no longer believe that the Bible is the Word of God. We are a stench in the nostrils of God. And what we need, brothers and sisters, is repentance. We need true preachers who are going to cry out against wickedness. I just want to say to you, in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, the Bible said, listen to what he says, As surely as I live, says Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Do you think God's sitting up in the sky going, Ooh, ha, ha, ha. No, God doesn't take pleasure in killing people. It says not in will that any would perish. It breaks God's heart that we've violated it and we've sinned and we've fallen to sin. But he's given his son for us. But how can you escape if you ne neglect so great a salvation? 
I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. What is God saying? I want you to come back home. I want you to come to me. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? America, why should we die? You want to keep living this lifestyle, but you don't want to understand the simple fact that the reason that we have the, the blessings we have is because previous generations believed in the righteousness of God. We have received the benefits of previous generations. And we're riding piggyback and horseback upon the previous prayers and dedication of previous generations. It's time for this generation, young people, middle-aged people, older people, rise up and stand up as one body of Christ and repent of our sins and ask for restoration. We need true churches and true preachers who will cry out against wickedness, who will recognize the deplorable condition of our nation. True believers should be heartbroken as we look out across the landscape and consider our plight. Now, let me conclude with this. I am not afraid. I don't need to be afraid. Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy the body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. I'm going to tell you who I fear. God Almighty. God is with me and all who truly know him. Yes, I am broken and my heart aches as I look at the society. As a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, I walk around and I sigh. I feel like sometimes I myself am a prophet. I feel like there's something that God's put in me that everybody else around me just doesn't seem to get. Maybe you feel that way as you're a spirit-filled, Bible-believing, blood-washed child of God. But I feel like I don't belong here because this is a society that's completely opposite of everything that I know in my heart God's calling us to. However, I know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think. I believe God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 3, I love this passage, verses 18 to 21. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love is. Can we hear somebody saying, Hallelujah, the love of God surpasses the ability to measure the width, the height, the depth, the length. May you experience the love of Christ that is too great to understand fully. Somebody ought to be just shouting right now and praising him for that. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us, the believers, to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or more than we think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. One day it's going to be over. We're almost home, children of God. Just keep looking to where we're going, not where we are. For those whose hearts are right with God and who seek His kingdom, good things can come because of their prayers. I believe that my prayers are going to change the nation. I believe that prayers of the saints, one saint on his knee, truly and sincerely seeking God, causes hell itself to tremble. And I want to know if two or three will come together in the mighty name of Jesus to fast, to pray, and seek God for repentance and restoration. Imagine what could happen. God is looking for such people. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says it this way. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Are you fully committed to God? Is he strengthening your heart right now? He's doing that for me. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not even staggered. You know why? Because I know God is with me. And even if the worst catastrophe comes... <laughs> You can't take what he's put inside of me. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and what's ahead of me is better than what's behind me. So you can't take away my joy. No wonder Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In Luke 12, 32, Jesus said, don't be afraid, little flock. It gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. The kingdom is ours, and the world can't take it away. Hallelujah. Are you one of the kingdom people? Are you one of the children of God? Are you walking in step with the master? Is your life filled with his word? And are you walking in submission to his word? Are you truly aware of your sins? Because if you're in his word, his word is a mirror in James 1, to 25. If you look into the perfect law of liberty, you see what it says. And when you do it, you'll be blessed in your deed, James 1, 25. But don't be just a hearer in James 1, and not a doer. Push back from the table the natural table, and pull up to the table of God. As the Holy Spirit gives instruction and seek the face of Jesus, not his hand, quit saying, give me this, give me that. I need this, I need that. And just say, Jesus, I've just come to say, I love you. And I need for you 
to rekindle the passion in my heart that you gave me when you saved me. Let's move from association to consecration. And here's the last things I want to say. In those days when you pray, I will listen, the Bible says. If you look for me wholeheartedly, Jeremiah chapter 29. If you look for me wholeheartedly. Now, here's the question. Are you looking at God? Just like instead of saying, I surrender all, I surrender some. Some to Jesus, I surrender some to him, I freely give. If we sing it, we really need to sing it that way because that's really the honest truth. Let's quit lying and say we surrender it all. But it's time to surrender it all. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. <laughs> Woo! Did you hear what that says? I will end your captivity and restore your fortune. Let me say it again. I will end your captivity, restore your fortune. If repentance comes, restoration will result. I will gather you out of the nations which I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. If he did this to Israel, who are we to think that we're beyond this? So don't worry about these things. And that's Jeremiah 29, 12 to 14 that we just read. Now let's close out with Matthew 6. Here's where I want to leave you. Some of you worried about how you're going to get your next roll of toilet paper. Some of you worried about if you're going to go to the store and find the pork chops in the meat section. But I just want to say to you, before there was a grocery store, there was Jehovah Jireh. And even when Elijah was alone, God brought an angel to feed him. He sent ravens to feed him. So why, why, don't worry about these things, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 34. What will you eat? What will we drink? That's the question at hand. What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Don't be going out there in pandemonium and just trying to scurry around and fight over things like the, the Tickle Me Elmo in the store they used to over the, in the years past. Can you imagine people fighting over a pack of toilet paper? How ridiculous. But you go to church and see you love Jesus, but you just cuss the man because he got the last thing of toilet paper. Shame on you. Maybe God needs to clean your mouth. These things dominate the th thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. So church, I want to remind you, don't lose your focus. Stay in church. For those of you who haven't been in church, get back in church. When the doors are back open, run to the church. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and then go out of the church and live like the church should. And he will give you everything you need. We believe God's going to take care of you. I do. He's brought me from there to here to take me from here to there. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So here's the last thing. Will you seek God with me? Will you cho join me in the needful discipline of fasting and prayer? in repentance so that we can see restoration. I pray you will. In Jesus' name. Lord, we pray right now that you'll help us all to turn from our stubborn and rebellious ways. And although at times we thought we had it together, God, remind us there's things you're still chipping away as the sculptor of our lives. You're still molding and making us as the potter, as we sit on the potter's wheel. God, you've broken us now. Would you remold us? Would you remake us? And would you restore us as we repent of our murders, of our thievery, of our greed, of our stubbornness, and of our rebellion? In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to this song as Jonathan comes to lead us in a song of response. Where you are, let this be your altar call. Yeah. 
of our sin. And as we call on your name, would you make this a place for your glory to dwell? Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf ears, and come to your people as we draw near. And hear us from heaven and touch our generation. We are your people who cry it out in desperation. Lord, hear our cry. Come, heal our land. Breathe life unto these dry and thirsty souls. Lord, hear our call on your name would you make this a place for your glory to dwell open the blind eyes unlock the deaf fears come to your people as we draw near hear us from heaven Touch our generation, and we are your people. We're crying out in desperation. Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf fears. We come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven. And touch our generation. We are your people. We cry out in desperation. Hear us from heaven. 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 to your people as we draw near hear us from heaven and touch our generation we are your people we cry out in desperation open the blind eyes unlock the deaf ears come to your people as we draw near, hear us from heaven, touch our generation, we are your people. 